Hi, I'm Chris Rodenheiser, and welcome to another episode of Beach Time. You know, service learning or volunteering is becoming a part of most all school programs. Most students find opportunities to volunteer in their local communities, but today we're going to check in with a group of students who chose to do their volunteering a little farther away from home. Try South Africa, Tanzania, Cambodia, Guatemala. <laughs> they all participated in Long Beach State's International Service Learning Program. Today we're going to get a chance to meet with the students as well as their program coordinator, find out a little bit more about the experiences, what they learned, and to peek in on a panel discussion that addresses more on the topic. Hi, I'm here with Sharon Olson, Director of Education Abroad. Sharon, thank you for agreeing to talk with us today. You're very welcome. Um, tell us exactly what you do with Education Abroad first off, and then we'll get into the actual program that we're filming today. Sure. Um, and we have an office of education abroad. It's in the Center for International Education here at Cal State Long Beach. And in our office, we do a full range of services for students um, and help advise them about study abroad, volunteer abroad, community service abroad, interning abroad, so that they have a lot of choices of what best fits their own individual interests um, in the global marketplace. That's fantastic. I wish when I was a student here we had that, that wealth of a service because it just gives students so many opportunities to think about traveling and visiting abroad. Right. Well and we're finding too, which I think is quite heartening to all of us, is that students are more interested now in community service and volunteering abroad um, and not just study valuable as that is. You know, I mean it's very important that they study abroad and intern abroad, but um, the service aspect I think is very important. Where do you think this has come from? Like why this sudden interest in uh, service learning and volunteerism? My impression is that students have now figured out that they live in a global world. That their world is going to be different than our world and that they are going to need to be competitive in a global marketplace. And one of the ways they can do that is by going abroad in a variety of ways. And data are now showing that actually volunteering abroad, even more so than interning abroad, increases and enhances their opportunities um, in the marketplace later on. So I don't know that they have actually um, kind of got that sorted out for themselves, but they certainly understand that they're going to need to be um, globally competitive and therefore they need to you know, be out of this country to do that. Now we're going to be meeting with a couple of the students today that participated in a, in a, a travel abroad program this summer where they volunteered. Can you tell us a little bit about specifically where some of these students went and what the objective or the goal was of the program? Certainly. Um, some of them actually went last January as part of a uh, program that goes to Cambodia. It was actually the fourth year. This last year will be the fifth year this January coming up. They do a program called Art and Social Action. And they've been doing the program with Carlos Silvera, who is in our art education department. Um, for that course, they actually work with community agencies in Cambodia. They work with children who are HIV positive. They work with young women who have been rescued from sex trafficking. And they're using art as a form of therapy to let the children kind of work through emotional issues and um, things that are um, inside them that it's easier to get out with an art piece maybe than talking to someone. So um, three of the students here today will be talking about that experience. Um, many of them have been, continued to volunteer since they got back from Cambodia. So um, the spirit of volunteerism wasn't just in another country. They're all actually uh, volunteering here in Long Beach um, this last year. Another group went to South Africa. They took a course called Death and Dying. Uh, doesn't sound like a very up subject, yeah. <laughs> but it's an important subject for um, them to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were actually, again, working with community agencies in South Africa um, and working with adults and with children um, in different agencies doing kind of volunteer and work projects um, for these agencies. Um, another um, group went to Tanzania with a faculty member here um, who taught this as part of a course and the students in, who went to Tanzania worked in a village and I believe they were working on some building projects there for the villagers so they were living and working in a village and seeing how people live um, there and also what they could do to volunteer. And then one young woman went on an independent program that was not connected with the university but connected with what we call an independent provider, international service volunteers and um, they go to a number of places around the world and we help our students choose those locations and providers and she went to the Dominican Republic. That's amazing. I mean that's just incredible opportunities for these young people. Yes, I, I agree and, and what is so important to me is when they come back 
the kind of impact that this makes on their lives. Well, and then we're going to be hearing about that because exactly. uh, we're going to interview. Right. We have them standing by. We're going to interview some of these students and find out actually how it might have changed the way they think about the world around them, uh, how they view themselves in, in a wider community in the world. So this right. should be very interesting. Thank you so much for bringing this to us. You're very welcome. <laughs> Alison Zimmer, who spent the summer in South Africa studying death and dying. Alison, I got to say that's kind of gruesome, kind of morbid. Tell us about your experience, what that was all about, and how you got involved in a course in South Africa about death and dying. Well, death and dying is something we all experience. We're all going to go through it. We're all going to know someone who dies, and it's something we all need to learn about. And in South Africa, there's a huge problem with AIDS and it's a very taboo subject, so they don't really talk about it, they don't really discuss it, and they don't really know much about it. So learning about, of course, death and dying in a country so apt to death and dying kind of made everything come full circle for us compared to had we studied it here. Mm -hmm. And we got to see people who were in the process of dying, people who had just lost somebody. We got to learn what the different cultures there did in the process of a funeral because every culture has a different way of going about uh, celebrating their afterlife or how to bury their loved one. So it's kind of like taking a course here on death and dying. I know the university offers, a lot of universities and high schools offer courses on death and dying, but you got to actually experience it culturally firsthand. Mm -hmm. We did. One of the organizations we worked with was HOPE, and through them we got to go in with uh, it's a program called Orphans and Vulnerable Children, OVC, and it's for kids who are affected or been affected by AIDS. And so through that, we just went in and we took pictures of them, we colored with them, we played games with them. A lot of the times we didn't uh, speak the same language, but communication is very easy with people in South Africa. And another program they run is called Prevention, and it's to teach kids how to prevent from getting pregnant and prevent from getting diseases and spreading diseases. And then another one of the programs we worked with over there was uh, Reboth, which was an old folks center. And we got to go in there and uh, hang out in the dementia room, just hang out and talk. And we got to work with them for a, they do like a once a week intramural sports competition. So we helped run that and set up the games and played with them. Being so far away from home and learning about something so emotional was hard. But my classmates and the people I met were so great that there was such a social support system within us that you could cry or you could express what you were feeling and it was okay. Yeah, I would imagine at times it was pretty heavy dealing with some of the issues you had to deal with. Our professor is amazing. Pamela Roberts, from start to finish, was there for us. Whether it was us having a complaint on something that happened in our day or being confused with a reading or wanting to know more about death and dying, she was always there willing to answer. So in retrospect, now that you're back home and you've been home for a couple months, what, what, what lasting effect did this experience have on you and what, that you'll carry through the rest of your life or that might have changed you as a person? Where do I even start? Well, I plan on going back next summer to go help more and go volunteer because the people there just leave this everlasting impression. And one of the things that really got me was we were in Dentalton in the middle of nowhere planting trees and we were taking pictures with the people in the community 
and these two women were, they told me, you have to send us this picture. I said, okay. They said, promise us. I said, okay, I promise you. And they say, don't disappoint us. And so instantly you think, these people have nothing more than their word sometimes, and their word is everything to them. So when I left, I left more conscious of what I say and who I say it to. And I will forever remember these people for what they've said to me. And That's a huge lesson. <laughs> it <That's> is. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. And all she wants is a photo, and she's just not, she's counting on you to not disappoint her. And we just sent the photo album to them last week, so they'll be getting all the photos we took. Hey, we're here with Katie Lalacata, who spent her summer in the Dominican Republic, and she studied volunteerism. I shouldn't say studied, you participated in volunteerism, a word I love. So I want you to explain a little bit about that word. And this was through an organization called ISV, which is the International Student Volunteer Organization. Tell us a little bit about ISV, volunteerism, and your experience in uh, the Dominican Republic. Very cool. Republic. Republic, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not Democrat. <Right. laughs> um, ISV, the, the trademark of what they do is volunteerism. Uh, their trips typically last about a month for students, and they send them to third world countries around the world. And the first two weeks is where the volunteering comes in. You, you are in a community or in a village, and you're helping with kids' camps, or you're helping with uh, conservation of the environment. And then the last two weeks is where the fun stuff comes in. You travel the country, and you get to stay in some of the... Uh, nicest locations in the given country that you're in and you do a lot of grassroots projects as far as the activities you participate in so it goes directly back to the community the people that are from where you're staying great and so isv organizes this and how do they connect with cal state long beach um through students like myself they have students that either work for them or i'm a isv campus rep and and we throw meetings to get the word out we put up posters and that's, that's their main, you don't have to be a student to participate, but that's their main, who they focus on. So tell me a little bit about what you did uh, as a volunteer in the Dominican Republic. Okay, I stayed in a village called El Cachote in the Baruco mountain ranges. Um, it's a UNESCO site. And we stayed there in a village at an eco-lodge. And, and the whole point of the village is to live within the community and, and have the people do uh, economic friendly practices. There's a lot of slash and burn that they're trying to eliminate. Um, solar panels, uh, electricity is a big problem. And so we help them build a school because they're isolated. They're two hours away from everything and the children need an education. And so the school will focus in uh, teaching students about the birds that live in the area and educating them about the species that live in the area and the plants and how to use them. And you were working with uh, people from the local community? Yes, we stayed there, they fed us, they housed us. How's your Spanish? It's all right. How you got five? I, Spanish Spanish or my Dominican Spanish? Oh, really? So there's quite a difference. Quite a difference. Quite a slang. Pardon my ignorance. That's okay. <laughs> um, so then, and afterwards, what, what, what was kind of the highlight of your tourism part? I went horseback riding on a white sand beach in the Dominican Republic as I watched kiteboarders fly all around, just galloping down the beach. The beaches are gorgeous there, aren't they? Incredible. And it's so nice to be able to, to see that people live in such a different way and they do just fine. And to come home and carry that with me and just kind of spread, spread the love they gave to me through all the simple things in their life that they appreciate. Fantastic. Any plans to go back? or now, and now as an ISV rep, I mean, do you have opportunities to continue to go to other places? Yes, I, uh, through, through the program I can go back to where I went. There are like nine, ten other countries that they're working with. They just started a program in Eastern Europe and in South Africa. And I would love to work with them next summer forever if I could. It's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks for talking. It sounds like you had a great experience. Thank you. All right. We are sitting here with uh, Kate, Matt, and Amy, three students who participated in the travel abroad to Cambodia this past January, correct? Almost a year ago. Tell us a little bit about your experience. Um, what, did you, what did you know before going in in terms of what you were getting yourselves into? Well, we all took a class before we went on the trip. It was a semester-long class called Art and Social Action in Cambodia. And so we kind of spent the semester preparing as far as learning about globalization itself and the forces um, that are kind of propelling that and controlling that. Um, and how that's specifically affecting Cambodia and its economy and its social issues as well. Um, and through that class also we prepared a lot for the actual trip itself and um, doing art with children and learning about art education as well. So tell me, art for social justice, can you describe that a little further and, and do you have to have an art background to participate in that? No, uh, the class was structured so that anyone could take it. Um, 
And I think um, the professor that runs this program, um, Dr. Carlos Silvera, is uh, just interested in exploring art as a way to, uh, um, that art can work as a um, something therapeutic, um, as an art therapy, or it can be a, a collaborative art project that could be an empowering, um, an empowering experience, making some kind of mural or some sort of group sculpture that, uh, that has to do with community concerns. Um, and that's fascinating. I mean, so that's fascinating. I mean, so, so then you know what you're going to be doing when you get over there, and then you get over there, and who? Some idea. You have some idea. Okay, so you weren't <laughs> totally prepared. So it was kind of a shocking. Yeah. So, um, Kate, what happened when you got over there? What What was your first reaction to your experiences there? It was just completely overwhelming. Everything we had actually prepared for, we had brought the art supplies with us and had a good idea as to what we were going to be doing. But once we got there, it was just kind of everyone for themselves. And it was really interesting to kind of just let go of any preconceived notions we had and really just open our eyes to what was actually going on. And what was going on? We, we each had, we each worked with different groups. Actually, Matt and I had the same group. We just worked at different times with children who had been rescued from the dump sites, children who were working in the dump sites, and then had been kind of taken to this place to live and eat and go to school and play. It was kind of just a safe zone, and mm -hmm. we ended up working with them. And then Amy ended up working with whom? Oh, I worked with a group called Aziza, and they're working in a slum community. And they have a school and um, other like community classes that they offer, as well as like kind of a safe space, like Kate was talking about. But different parts of the city. We were in very urban um, apartment complex, kind of. And you guys were much more outside of the city, yeah. right? We were just out on some dirt road. <laughs> yeah, it seemed like it was a, a building that they could uh, they could get pretty easily. But I th I thought that was the strength of this particular program was the fact that um. Um, now that it's been happening for a few years, there are relationships with different um, NGOs or different nonprofit organizations. But still, it's not, there's not a lot of administration that's going on. So the students are forced to build relationships with um, the really wonderful people that, are, that have started these organizations or staff there. And so trying to build relationships with the kids and the staff and figure out how to make some kind of cohesive project was... Um, the hardest, maybe, but also the most fulfilling also, well, part of it. Also, there's a huge think? language barrier mm -hmm. as well. And we were fortunate enough to work with a university there. So we had university students who were learning English while speaking Khmer, and so they ended up working as our mm -hmm. translators and helped us work with the kids. But I found the language barrier to be awesome because you learn so much more with the kids and you play so much more, and it's much more physical. Mm -hmm. But also trying to explain certain art techniques to someone who speaks limited English and then have them explain it to children who've never mm -hmm. done it. Yeah, that's With so it's not like your translators are fluent. No, oh, and no so they're university kind of students. Yeah, they're, they're so you just kind of have to be open-minded the whole time. That's an incredible experience. Now, what, how did the kids receive you? you mean, here, they're looking at you, you're Americans. I mean, did you kind of feel like you were the knights in shining armor? Or were, were because of that, <laughs> I can already tell from your reaction that's not how it was. I think for our group, we were working with adolescents um, all, all the way up to ages like 24, 25. Um, we didn't really work with younger kids. And so teenagers in any culture kind of demand that you develop a rapport with them and, and they have to have some level of kind of an understanding and um, relationship and some kind of respect. Um, they, they don't just immediately love you, of course. Um, and we really had the unique opportunity with our um, organization that we got to be there like six out of the seven days of the week from 10 a.m. till 9 p.m. all day um, and so we really got to spend a lot of time with them which I think for older students is really important if you're going to be kind of building this level of trust um, in, a, in a teaching context um, so that was a really interesting experience because I think we initially thought that we'd be going with little kids and it's kind of a different um, approach that you have with younger little ones Absolutely. than you have with these kind of teenagers that have well, that are hardened yeah. because of their life, the way they've lived their life. It's and they, they have so much life experience already coming in that um, really getting to know them was really important to us, I think. Right. You worked with children. Mm -hmm. We worked with children probably ages 3 to 12 or 13. Yes. So when I know when I walked in, I was 
so nervous and I expected to find this place with like children like sullen and all beaten down. They were like monkeys and they treated me like a jungle gym as soon as I got in. Like I had two of them braiding my hair and one putting like a necklace around me and one like like looking through all my bags and they were so happy and so excited. And I think by this point they've had other Americans or other people from cultures come in and help and work and at least play Mm -hmm. and some bring them presents and I think they're used to having outsiders come in. They were very welcoming. Yeah, the, it was. I think it was. We we talked with other students, with the university students that Kate mentioned. We work with. They they felt like the um the orphanage type um centers or organizations. The the kids were way more uh, open to new people coming in because they're used to that in their lives, and they would just run up and hug you. Versus mm-hmm. kids more at sort of like an after school program, um, like that Amy worked with, and there was another group we worked with. The kids were a little bit more standoffish and more like we might expect. Yeah, they have their own families and their own lives versus these kids that kind of like this whole group of kids Mm -hmm. is their home and their family. I think it's a little different. Just different. Like I saw a huge gate outside and it was very secluded. And like we had to get special permission. We took our kids just on a walk around Mm -hmm. just the center and their streets just so they could show us their lives. Mm -hmm. But I know that Amy's was so open and I went to visit her one day and they were children from all the communities and like older people like watching them and everyone wanted to see what they were doing and be a part Mm -hmm. of their mural that they were doing. Whereas ours was kind of... Ours became much of an almost community experience because our like where we were working is basically like this kind of... um, I don't know how to describe it. Yeah, it's like a project, but a really in a much smaller space, but tons of people. So, you know, the neighbors next door are coming over to the school. The school's in this apartment complex. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's people that are living in these kind of shacks behind the complex. And every it's very communal. And every like all the moms sit together and all the kids play together. And the school has become a part of that kind of communal living. And so our what we did, we were doing a mural project. And that really came became a community effort. So we had parents painting and little kids. It's got to be very rewarding for you and for the community. Yeah, they all came to visit too. And it was just such a fun kind of, I don't know, community I think, experience. I think we should, st- I mean, you may ask about this, but when you talked about the idea of what we thought we were going to accomplish mm-hmm. coming in, just that part of what um, Carlos talks about and what we talked about in the class was um, realizing that this is going to be a personal transformative experience or an educational experience for us and there's only a a limited amount of stuff we're going to contribute. I mean as far as what we know of Mm -hmm. the culture, the the situation that um, the people we worked with were in and I think um, the change in us was much more profound and I think the experience was much more impactful on us than yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sure yeah we we mm-hmm. accomplished in any sense we wanted to make um. it as smooth of a transition as we could because the idea of it was also hard for us but I can only imagine what it's like to have a bunch of people come in do art with you for a few weeks and then just leave yeah, ditch you and go back to America right. especially for the yeah. orphans especially for the orphans and, so, yeah. and yeah. the people who have just had people leave them their whole lives so I think the idea of how they loved art and they craved it, and they loved just the attention mm-hmm. and everything that they got from it. So having an artist then come in after we leave was really nice for them to continue to work on that. And, build and this that. is a local artist. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, what about some of the um, things that you were surprised about in terms of the art that kids created or the community created? I mean, did it come out differently, or did you learn something from, from the art? I had no idea what to expect, and I thought that it was going to be like this profound, like emotional painting. But really, they're just kids with a couple crayons, and some things really got to you. The way that we had them draw how they see the community, and how they would see their dream community, and they were very different, and they wanted to see what my community was like. And so there was a lot of back and forth, and it was very open. But they're still just children. Yeah. who love to finger paint and want to paint themselves and see who has the sharpest pencil. And that's uh, a lot of... It's kind of refreshing, actually. Yeah, it was. It was really it was refreshing good. and very yeah. funny to see. Any other... Uh... With our students, uh, we talked a l- We did a mural project, so it was a much longer uh, multi-week project. Um, and we started just with a discussion about... Um, what what their values were, what was important to them and their personal lives, and what was important to them in aspects of their future and as far as their community is concerned, so kind of three different aspects. Um, 
we kind of did like a, a group brainstorming and then kind of had them like start to narrow down the most important things. We had this kind of process mm -hmm. and we had this big whiteboard and just started writing down what each person kind of, they would stand up and share what their most top three were. And the things that we got from each student were so unexpected and so um, insightful. Uh, three students who spent their summer in Tanzania. I have Lucretia, Lynette, and Aaron here. And uh, thank you three for agreeing to talk to us. I'd like to hear about your experience in Tanzania. Well, it made me kind of reevaluate re what what we really need because hmm. we talk about need over here a lot. I need right. this. I need. We really don't need much. Everything they need, they pretty much had. I mean, they had water. They had food. People aren't you know starving or famished like a lot of people. I got that response right away when I said I was going to Africa. Oh, well, you know, aren't they starving there and there's war? I'm like, no, it's, you know, perfectly. It depends on the country, I suppose. Yeah. Well, where we were going, it was politically Definitely. neutral. Like, yeah. you know, they have plenty of running water, plenty of yeah. food. I mean, so their idea and concept of needing ours is completely different. We don't need, you know, probably 90% of what we have over here. Yeah. Ours is want. We just want more. Yeah, yeah so. And we consume. I mean, they, they really recycle. We talk about recycling. They recycle so Everything. much stuff and use it, reuse it in different interesting creative ways. Yeah. You know, we here we just dump everything in the trash and it's really unnecessary to yeah. do that. I think I'd like all three of you to become teachers and just, you know, you know, it's like <laughs> good. I mean it's just it's just a, to give that lesson to people who didn't have the advantage of going there and seeing firsthand. I mean, who reads the paper to to about what's going on in Tanzania and knowing these kind of social issues that are going on? Exactly. Lynetta brought up uh, the need aspect, and one of the thing that I found, things that I found interesting while we were there is um, we started finding out that, because we were like, it doesn't seem like a lot of people are working, but they're working, but they're working for, it's, 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 it's odd, how, it's, it's different how they work. That's what it is. It's different. Is it like for their own personal survival? It is. It's for their own personal survival and their, com their communities. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they're very community um, oriented. oriented, you know what I mean? So what they have happening is, Everybody, there's never a shortage of food because there's food growing everywhere. And you can literally go and grab it off the sidewalk, but people don't. People don't, there, there isn't like stealing and things like that going on. Yeah, yeah. But go what you have happen is people, a person will get a job. They'll get a job where they actually get paid money just enough, just so that they can make enough money to buy something for somebody else a lot of the time. And then once they get, them, get enough money, they quit the job because they don't need the job or the money because they have food, they have shelter. Wow. They have all those things, and it's like to to see that coming from America. It's like, wow, what are you like? Don't you want more? So they money? make so little. What they make is so little, yet they donate it or give to their right. community. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. And it's just, I don't know. Wow, what a great opportunity for these young people to not only have traveled to these amazing destinations, but to make the trip more meaningful and with a purpose by volunteering. I hope you enjoyed what they brought back with them, the stories, the, the experiences, and learned something from it. I know I have. I'm Chris Rodenheiser, and I look forward to seeing you back to another episode of Beach Time really soon. Thanks for tuning in.